Hello everybody, this is Sam Utari here, and welcome to Guild Wars 2. Now, this is something that I never thought I'd be able to do, be just because my PC has never really been able to handle it, um, or my old one, when I was actually making my original videos. But, um, yeah, so for my birthday, which is in about four days, um, my wife actually bought me a new character slot so that I could actually kind of showcase a new character, showcase the storyline, and showcase, like, a lot of the highlights of Guild Wars 2 because I have been completely addicted to it. Um, Guild Wars, as most of you know, is one of my favorite games, and Guild Wars 2, though it did take some getting used to, is actually uh, another one of my favorite games that I have come to love and cherish, uh, just because of how amazing it is once I actually gave it a chance and was able to play it regularly. Um, so before I start a new character, I guess I'll just go over my actual characters. So this is my main right now. Her name is Tanalis. Uh, she's a Norn Ranger. Uh, she's level 80, which is actually the max level that you can achieve, achieve in Guild Wars 2 as of right now. Uh, much better than the level 20 uh, cap in the original Guild Wars. Uh, the Norn, as most of you know, uh, come from Eye of the North, but I'll go into the races when we make a new character. So she's beaten the main campaign, I am, and she's beaten Living World Season uh, 2, since Li Living World Season 1 was live and you can't really go back and play that. Uh, and now she's working on the Heart of Thorns expansion. Once I beat that, she'll do Living World Season 3, Path of Fire, and then Living World Season 4. This is my gal Tiernsel, uh, named after my w WoW character actually blasphemous as it may seem. She is also a level 80 ranger, but she's a race called the Silvari. She's currently working through the Path of Fire expansion so that I can get those awesome mounts. Um, another level 80 character I have is Erse. I have reinvented my Guild Wars 1 character, uh, and she is a level 80 human mesmer. She's working through her campaign. Uh, Tapiji, aka Tippy. She's my level 80 Asura Engineer. She is also working through the campaign at this moment. And other than that, I just have some stragglers. I've got Exith. Uh, she is working, uh, she's my human necromancer. I'm still not really sure how I feel about necromancer. So she's only level 50. Uh, Ellicent's my level 59 Silvari Elementalist. Again, just kind of playing with the classes. Uh, Agir, Bloodfang, he is my Char, uh, level 65 Char Warrior. I actually really like the Warrior. Um, it's something that I probably should play more of because I really love the heavy armor, especially the Heritage gear, which I'll go into the Heritage gear. And then I recreated Ollie here recently. She was a level 60 Thief, but I decided I really don't like the Thief class that much. And so I recreated her as an engineer, which I think will suit my needs a lot better. And then uh, my, one of my newest characters outside of the recreated one is my level 35 human ranger named Aldrith. So these are just a few of my characters that I've been playing around with, but now I'm going to create a new one and go over some things like with you when it comes to Guild Wars 2, because I find that it's a fantastic MMO. So we're going to go to the create menu, and then hopefully it uh, does what I want it to. Okay, so immediately you are allowed to select your race. Now for those that have played Guild Wars, you can now see that you have options. Uh, Guild Wars, throughout Guild Wars, Prophecies, Factions, Nightfall, and Eye of the North, you could only ever play as human, even though you did interact with other races. So, Char. The Char race was forged in the merciless crucible of war. It is all they know. War defines them, and their quest for do dominion drives them ever onward. The weakling and the fool have no place among the Char. Victory is all that matters, and it must be achieved by any means at any cost. Now the Char, um, they are a race of cat-like people. They are the main enemies uh, of Guild Wars Prophecies. Well, one of the main enemies of Guild Wars Prophecies. The humans face off against the Char because the Char uh, attack their kingdom of Ascalon and they drive the humans out and the humans must then flee to Krita for safety. We see the Char again in Eye of the North when the Ebon Vanguard are facing off against them. Again, the Ebon Vanguard are still fighting against the Char and hoping to take back Ascalon, which at that time in the uh, at that point in the timeline still has not completely fallen. So the humans are still trying to win that war. 
with the Char. So the human and Char remain enemies for a very long time, and now in this timeline, the Chars have uh, the Char have reclaimed Ascalon, and now they're trying to drive off the human ghosts, um, the remnants of the past that still plague uh, Ascalon and Ashford. And then we have the human. Uh, humans have lost their homeland, their security, and their former glory. Even their gods have withdrawn, and yet the human spirit remains unshaken. These, have, these brave defenders of Krita continue to fight with every ounce of their strength. So, now you see Krita. See, in, in Guild Wars, we have many races, well, we have many uh, different factions of humans. We have the ones in Cantha, Alona, and then, of course, there's the ones that reside within, uh, the ones that did reside within Ascalon and then Krita. Well, as I said before, in Prophecies, the Char drive the humans out of Ascalon. They all must flee to Krita. So most of the, the humans that you'll see here, they're, they're now mixed. Ascalonians and Cri Critons are now mixed um, anymore. They're just known as Critons because that is where the humans have made their homeland. In the main game of Guild Wars 2, we do not hear of Cantha or Ilona. It's not even until the Path of Fire expansion that we head back to Ilona. So right now we're just playing as uh, just the basic uh, human, which is the Crichton, the longtime descendant of the humans that were fighting against the Char. Uh, the Norn. This race of towering hunters experienced a great defeat when the Ice Dragon drove them from their glacial homeland. Nevertheless, they won't let one lost battle, however punishing, dampen their enthusiasm for life and the hunt. They know that only the ultimate victor achieves legendary rewards. Uh, Norn were a race that we saw in Eye of the North. Uh, we ran into the Norn when Jorah basically said that she was hunting her brother. In Eye of the North, we were playing as a human, and we were trying to uh, basically defeat the Destroyers, which had been a new threat that popped up on Tyria. And uh, they were tunneling beneath every city, and I guess they had affected other races as well. The Norn, we wanted them as our allies, but we could not get them as our allies until we helped Jorah and she spoke to her people. Um, the Norn at the time didn't really have an army, that, and they still don't. They live for the Great Hunt, but that's about it. But they're very powerful, giant people, they can shapeshift. Um, think of them more as like tribal people, ancient people, they uh, worship the spirits, that kind of thing. So they're an amazing race, and they first popped up in the Guild Wars expansion, and now in Guild Wars 2 we can play them. Uh, Asura. These halcomagical Alc inventors may be short in stature, but they're intellectual giants. Among the Asura, it's not the strong who survive, but the clever. Other races believe they should rule by virtue of their power and strength, but they're, delu they're deluding themselves. In due time, all will serve the Asura. Now, the Asura are very intelligent, and again, they are ju they're a race that popped up in Eye of the North. Um, same as the Talking Char. Um, the As and the the Norn, uh, the Asura, they were a race that lived underground, and the destroyers actually drove them to the surface. They are actually very intelligent. They've created, you know, um, magical gates that can teleport people to multiple locations across the map. In Guild Wars 2, they already know that money is going to rule the world. They are pretty much greedy, in a sense, because everything that they do, they charge money for, even if money is not needed to run these machines. They will gladly sacrifice anybody and anything for the sake of science, but they are really brilliant, and uh, they'll let you know. <laughs> We saw uh, the Asura in Eye of the North with Vec. He was also one of our heroes that we could actually uh, uh, recruit to help uh, get rid of the Destroyers. He was an Elementalist, I believe, and I used him a little bit, but mostly I kept with Jorah and Ogden. Now, one race that you're not going to see here is the Dwarves. And you would think with Eye of the North, you know, with the Norn coming back and the Asura coming back and even the Char coming back, all of which were heroes that you could recruit during Eye of the North, you would think that you would see dwarves somewhere in here. But there are no dwarves in this timeline. The dwarves are extinct. Instead, what we got are the Silvari. Now, the Silvari, fun fact, again, um, I, I wish I could say that they do show up in Eye of the North, but they really don't. The Silvari are a race exclusive to Guild Wars 2. However, their beginnings we actually see in Guild Wars 1. Now, if you play, um, I believe it's Guild Wars Nightfall, 
Um, eventually, while you're wandering the desert, I don't know if it's the Crystal Desert or whether it's in Elona, I, or whether it's in um, Nightfall, but eventually you run across the centaur named Ventari, and when you're talking to Ventari, he'll have you do some quests. He'll talk about the violence among the centaurs and how he hates it. You know, he knows it's bred into them, but he's different. Um, he's a pacifist. So when you meet Ventari, after you do quests, he basically runs off. He says that he has somewhere to go because he wants to go to a place without all the bloodshed. Later on, you find Ventari in the jungle, and right next to him is this tree that has started to sprout. And it's almost about as tall as him, and he calls it, you know, the pale tree. And he has planted it as a statement of peace. And from the Pale Tree, the Silvari are born. So it's really cool to see that in Guild Wars 1, you can visit Ventari, you can see the Pale Tree, and from the Pale Tree, the Silvari will come. And at this point, uh, when the Silvari do come into the world, when they are born into the world, uh, they actually, Ventari is actually passed on, but he leaves behind his tablets. And so his word actually creates the law of the Silvari. So Silvari are not born. They awaken beneath the pale tree with knowledge gleaned in their pre-life dream. These noble beings travel, seek adventure, and pers in pursuing quests. They struggle to balance curiosity with duty, eagerness with chivalry, and warfare with honor. Magic and mystery entwine to shape the future of this race that has so recently appeared. Now, I thought about which character I wanted to make, and originally I was going to make a Norn, because they are my favorite, and I only have one. And then I was like, no, um, I'd rather make a human, because I'm very partial to humans. Um, they've gone through a lot. And then I was like, you know what? Why not Silvari? Like, they're literally, they're literally the new race. Like, I would like to make a Silvari warrior. Like, I don't know why... Um, so now that we choose Silvari, or if you choose any of them, you can choose between male and female. I'm gonna go ahead and choose a male, because I already have two females. Here are your classes, and as you can see, a lot of them are very different, um, than Guild Wars 1. So we got your basic, your warrior, your ranger, your necromancer, elementalist, and mesmer. And, um, so these are the ones that kind of stuck around. Your new ones are the guardian, thief, engineer, and revenant. Revenant only came out with the release of Heart of Thorns. Now, the Guardian is kind of like your Paladin. Um, they specialize in protective and defensive magic, so yeah, they're more like a Paladin. Your Thief is honestly more like an Assassin. If you've ever played Guild Wars Factions, um, the Assassin class, it basically has translated into the Thief. Uh, they're very stealthy, they've got a lot of uh, neat tricks that make them disappear into shadows, run away really quickly, but it's very tactical and I don't really care for it. The Revenant is, in a sense, kind of like a ritualist. I love their armor, but I just hate the class. Um, they basically summon spirits from the mists. Uh, they can summon Ventari, they can summon Chino um, from frickin' factions, they can summon Balthazar and stuff. Like They can basically summon these powerful spirits to inhabit their bodies and give them new abilities. So you have a lot of different abilities, more than most classes, but I don't know, just the way that it's used, I just don't like. However, the new classes, I do love the Engineer. The Engineer, they can make turrets, which they can place on the ground, so like rocket launcher turrets, uh, you know, trap turrets, just regular bullet turrets. Uh, they can make a uh, rams that can blast an enemy away and they get to use guns and i think that's what i love is that the use of guns in this game is actually really fantastic and uh so yeah um the mesmer class in this one is actually changed as well they don't have the same types of magic as they did before everything that you do as far as magic is actually determined by what weapons you equip which i'll show you that later because nowadays you're not actually restricted to just using like a wand or a staff. Uh, mesmers can actually use swords and pistols and all those other things, uh, torches. My mesmer, um, Erse, she uses a sword in one hand, a pistol in the other, because it creates a skill combo that I actually really like. Whereas um, her secondary weapon set is a staff, because that allows me to do long range damage with a different set of skills. 
so elementalist of course you can choose between what elements you want to control there's four that you can control total i believe there's earth fire yeah wind and water necromancers are basically the same you can still summon your minions uh you can still drain the life out of other people and summon hordes of swarming bugs and then ranger which i love the ranger it is my favorite class that's why my two mains are rangers. Uh, so rangers, of course, you can have a pet companion, and it's really awesome. Um, my favorite combos are using the longbow, which you can send down like a rain of freaking arrows. You can shoot an arrow that allows you to go invisible for a time to get away from enemies. There's a knockback arrow. And then, of course, you have your pet commands that you can uh, command your pet to do things for you. Um, I also like the twin axes on the ranger, because then I can throw them, freeze people, create a bubble where I take no damage for a minute while I slash the crap out of people. So, it's really fun. It's a, it's a great class. It's very versatile in what you can do. And then there's the warrior. So, heavy armor, you know, big swords, big maces, big hammers. So, I think I'm going to go with a warrior. I don't know. This might be a bad idea. Who knows? So, like, the customization actually has changed, too, from Guild Wars 1 to Guild Wars 2. Um, the, the customization is just, it's, it's really is massive. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and hide my armor. <laughs> I love how they have it freaking. Jesus. So, the Silvarior made all of plant, if you haven't noticed. So, and they got that weird belly button thing going on. So, you can choose their height, and then you can choose their body type. Eww. So, I really just don't want something super bulky. I wouldn't mind him having a big chest. So as you can see, this is like a more... That's the less defined chest, and then you start getting into the more defined chest. Which I'd want him to have a more defined chest, but I want it to be, you know, yeah, big. So... I don't know, I'd say that... Oh, it's so hard to choose. Character customization always takes the most. I really want him to have a shape to him. That's just my personal thing. Oh yeah, and you can already choose the skin color. Um, I really haven't decided skin color because I generally don't decide skin color until I've picked out the rest of the features. So I'll probably come back to that um, for now, I guess. I don't know. There's just like there's so many like most most creatures can cannot be this many colors. So I think that's why I have a hard time with the with the Silvari because most most creatures cannot be this many colors. So, skin pattern. So not only do you get your defined muscles and all that, but you can actually choose the skin pattern, which will determine more colors, because they are all different colors of foliage, all different colors of freaking leaves, and so you gotta choose a color that's gonna go well with everything else. Well, that one's pretty neat. But yeah, so... So some of it's just texture stuff, some of it's just highlight stuff. Oh, goodness gracious. It's really hard. It is really hard. Pattern color. Glow color. Like, do you see where this all, like... Like, I like the gold. I think the gold's great. But then it's like, okay, the, the glow color. Where, where's the glow? I don't see the glow. What if I make that gold as well? What changes? So you can see my problem here. Oh, it's probably because I'm not clicking it. Did that change anything? Oh well. <laughs> We're gonna keep moving on. I'm not gonna stay here forever. Head options. So already we can choose the hair. I really do like his hair. Um, I like the hair already. Let's see. You can do do like a toad thing going on. Um, let's see. Make him bald. See, this one's always been like a really neat, neat color. Let's see what happens when I give him honey hair. Or lemonade hair. Lemonade hair looks a little bit better. Let's see. There's the hair I had before. See, I like that. I like I like the the honey color in that. I like the mohawks. The mohawks are really cool. So I like how they have twigs sticking out of them. This is like I like to call this the Traherne hair. He's a character in there. This one's all tree branches. That one makes him look like an avocado. That one's the typical hairstyle I see most people choose. And this one is the hair that a lot of other people choose. But I 
think I'm gonna go with this one for now because this one seems to be my favorite. Now the face. Ah, uh, his face looks super intimidating, so I am gonna change up his face. He's got like a little bit of an Asian theme going on, so. But unfortunately, with the faces, you don't really have you don't have many many options. I do like this face. It's kind of babyish, you know, but he, he still looks cute. I like his little plant goatee going on. Oh, he's got a full-on beard here. But it it kind of reminds me of a Draenei. This one just looks creepy. I don't know. A lot of the Silvari, like, I think they're really awesome. I like their texture. I like the fact that they are made of plant, but because they're made of plant, like, their features, they're just like, they look like they're dead. <laughs> it's like, and I hate saying that, because I think that they're adorable. You know, I think that they're really cute. Okay, so it comes between this one and this one. But I think I'm going to choose this one. So, skin color. Sage. Whoa! So this changes his whole body. That actually helps. Okay, I'm glad that they gave me that option right now. That's light leaking. Well, I mean, he'd match his armor. He'd be all silver and stuff. I mean, I think that's pretty cool. Sorry if I'm taking a long time, guys. Like, uh, this is actually the longest I have ever taken on a character. I swear to Bob. Ooh, a brown Silvari. That's a thing. So, I actually... Fine. Um, say... Leakin. Yeah, no, I like the, I like the silvery look. I like the silvery green look. I think it's a nice a nice look for him. Okay, so now that we got the face, we can pick the ears. And right now his ears are these little like feathery things. Um let's see. Those are leaves. More feathery things. More feathery things. Actual elf ears, which is usually the ear that I, I prefer. I always give them really long ears too, because like think of these guys as the elves, honestly, because kind of what they are. Give them droopy ears because it gets adorable. Um, so that was the elf ears. Yeah, the middle. And then <laughs> you can give them like a, a little blue. So we'll stick with the elf ears. I think those are adorable. Face details. Now I'm not gonna I'm not gonna mess with these like honestly but look look at all of this. Like look at all these things that you can do. It's so ridiculous the things that you can do with this. Um, you know, the eye color, the eye size, the pupil size, like, you can do so much with these, and it's just so crazy, like, I'm not against it, obviously, like, oof, um, I'm not, I'm not against having these options, it's just like, but if you're wanting to do a let's play or something, and you're really wanting to show, like, all that you can do, I mean, you can customize your eyes, you can customize the nose, the mouth, the, the freaking chin size, like, you can make him smile, you can make him frown, you can, you know, you can make his eyes huge in anime, you can make him super short, you can even, like, make their heads bigger. Uh, I had to do that with my char, make her head just a little bit bigger to make it proportionate to her, or, I mean, a little bit smaller to make it more proportionate to her body. Like, the amount of customization really makes it so that when you're running into another character, even if they have the same hair as you, even if they have the same body type as you, and even if they have the same, like, markings as you, you're still gonna have a pretty unique character if you go through and you change some of these settings, so... It's really pretty neat. I don't know. I, I love the, the customization. I was It was one of those things that I was way super stoked for. So I'm gonna go ahead and just put him in silver armor. Um, I don't know, to, I guess, to see how it looks. So this is more reminiscent of Guild Wars 2. So it's definitely more reminiscent of Guild Wars 2. Um, the fact that you can choose the colors of the armor. Let's see. I would want that to be silver. It needs to be dark. I really just like regular colored armor. I'm not really, not really too keen on anything else. Um, I'm trying to keep it simple, but also at the same time, I wanna. I just kind of want to see what colors go well with him, um, because I am making him this way. So once you. Uh, 
once you make your character, once you customize them, it actually gives you a story prompt. It allows you to select your background, which is something that I think is really unique to Guild Wars 2. Now, uh, the thing with it is that um, when you're choosing this story, it actually affects how your game plays out. It's literally called My Story. And the thing is, is it gives you like three options per screen. There's like four screens, and then, um, you know, that affects how your beginning starts. It affects your, uh, the first chunk of your quests, um, whatever storyline you choose. And so, again, it, it, it's one of those things that actually creates a very unique experience per player because these choices actually do matter and even though all characters towards the end end up like kind of uh following the same path and following the same story the trails the paths in order to get to that main story where everybody meets uh is usually completely unique to that person because of these choices in the beginning so i wear blank on the battlefield because of this i am recognized and given proper respect no helm. A true warrior doesn't need a helm. My enemies will cringe and falter when they see the fearless determination on my face. A Galea. My helm is open faced so that my enemies can see my face and look me in the eyes. They'll remember who defeated them. A Sprangen helm. My Sprangen helm intimidates my enemies and inspires respect among my allies. I am nearly invulnerable when I wear it. No helm, because you're pretty. Trouble may follow me, but I use my blank to overcome it. My charm. Dignity, ferocity, charm. I'm charming. No one can resist me when I'm at my best. I know just what to say to lighten the mood and bolster courage. Dignity. I'm dignified even when up to my ears in mud. It's what makes people respect me. A serious, thoughtful demeanor is the root of su success. Ferocity. I'm ferocious. Threatening violence gets me further than anything else. I'm a natural, though. I do try to use my powers of intimidation for good. Dignity. I think he'd be dignified. I can see him as a charmer, but I also see him as actually being kind of shy. Um, I dreamed of a quest that calls me to action. It was a vision of the blank. The White Stag. The White Stag is a creature of enchantment, an immortal beast with great power. It is said that the stag will trade a magical boon for its freedom if I can catch it. Green Knight. I saw a powerful knight in green armor, his face obscured. He was defeated, but not did not submit. He was killed, but did not die. Dare I face him in battle? Shield of the Moon. The moon is a powerful symbol of healing and magic. Any who dream they're protected by the moon shall know the faith and fortitude. I hope I'm worthy of such a vision. We're gonna choose the Green Knight. We could be the Green Knight, who knows? I believe that the most important of Ventari's teaching is... Act with wisdom, but act. It is one thing to know what is right and another to change the world. We all have a calling. I will distinguish myself through my actions and thereby lift Tyria to a higher state of mobility. All things have a right to grow. The blossom is brother to the weed. Diversity of opinion is good. Discussion is healthy. No one should be condemned simply for being different. I will stand up for the rights of all. Uh, where life goes, so too should you. The world is a delicious and glorious place created for us to explore, enjoy, and protect. I will seek out the lessons in every experience, and as I grow, I will have more to offer in return. Um, I think this one, where life goes, so too should you. I could see him as an explorer. The pale tree awakened me during the cycle of dawn. Silvari, Silvari awakened at dawn are natural talkers, diplomats, and forward thinkers. We are intimately connected with our surroundings and marked empathetic toward all, even other races. Cycle of noon. Silvari awakened midday, solved problems by attacking them head on. We are the warriors, hunters, and travelers who experience life firsthand and enjoy the rush of taking risks in order to feel truly alive. Cycle of Dusk. Silvari Awakened at Dusk are naturally curious and thoughtful. We love to learn and spend time reading and studying. We are intelligent and drawn towards the luscious complexities of magic and the cycle of night. Silvari Awakened at Night are secretive and cautious with information. We make our own decisions. We come and go as we please. Nimble of mind and body. Cycle of Noon. And then, though trouble may follow me, I overcome it with dignity. The Pale Tree awakened me during the cycle of noon, and the most important of Ventari's teaching is where life goes, so too should you. While in my dream, I dreamed of the Green Knight. I'm called to find him. I'm a warrior, and I wear no helm on the battlefield. Because of this, my enemies falter when they see my fearless determination in my eyes. This is my story. Signed. Let's see if Aquila works. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if it does, but we'll see. Signed, Aquila. Yeah, Aquila's already in use. So...
Well, this is not working. What is your name, beautiful man? Sarenoon. Sarenoon. Oh my god. People are gonna think his name's Kernan. <laughs> Sarenoon. Jesus. That took forever. Thank you.